ladies and gentlemen, um, we'll begin, if we may. Um, my name is uh, Dr. J. Simon Wolf, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening um, to an event looking at uh, sport and diplomacy, particularly around sport uh, diplomacy and governance. Um, we are in the midst of, uh, and I say we, my uh, compadre um, Verity Postlethwaite, who has been busily uh, uh, organising much of today, who I need to pay due uh, deference to and indeed respect to for having got us here, um, are in the midst of putting together a ESRC research bid um, for looking at the diplomacy of sport and governance, particularly around in our post-Brexit world, what Brexit could mean for that. Um, we have a couple of people with some professional insight into that in the room, but um, more broadly, none of us really know. So um, we are waiting to see what that might mean. And really, we want to think about some of the broad issues that the sport and diplomacy programme discussion uh, discourse, whichever uh, academic um, adjective you want to use, um, has been undertaking over the last four, five, six years now. And to that end, we've got two um, papers or, or presentations uh, from Stu Wiggum from uh, Oxford Books and from our very own uh, Jay Kang from the School of Arts. Um, and we will run through their presentations in hopefully not too uh, keeping to time. And then um, we're going to have a couple of perspectives from some of our sport and diplomacy students that we have um, brought in, um, having taken the class this year, and also then open ourselves up for uh, some questions. And really what I wanted to sort of draw out of this is perhaps two things. One is that this is part of an ongoing conversation. I've mentioned some of the things we've done in the past, but really there's a, a dialogue here. And whatever you, uh, whatever you're here, um, what uh, reason you might have, whatever experience, interest, um, we'd be interested to hear uh, what else you have to say, as it were. So please feel free to contribute. Um, we will not be running a, a sort of strict ship in that regard. We are welcoming of the dialogue. And the second thing is with regard to having this conversation beyond this you know, physical space uh, between now and seven o'clock this evening. Um, obviously, um, devices such as these allow us to communicate with those who aren't here. But part of uh, an ongoing conversation. So if there are thoughts that come to you on the train home or when you wake up in the morning, um, feel free to be back in touch. Um, we will be uh, doing more of these kind of events and we would welcome the kind of dialogue. So please feel free to be in touch. So without any further to do, I will hand over to Stu, who's going to set us off. Thank you very much, Simon. And also thank you to um, Verity, who's at the back there. Uh, Miss Simon's thanks for uh, putting this event together. It's been a very enjoyable day so far in terms of doing that. Um, I, I guess Verity knows me quite well because she uh, did two things to prepare me for today. Firstly, she said, just put together two or three slides and then just talk to them and then that'll hopefully keep you to time. I, I've gone to seven or eight, but she probably said, if I said do seven or eight, it'd be 12, 15, 16. So I managed to try and keep myself fairly concise uh, as best I can, so hopefully, as Simon said, to open up some debate and dialogue around some of the things that I'll be presenting upon. The second thing is you got me a beer before presenting today, uh, which Simon's now sat next to. Um, so um, if I do talk quickly and incoherently, it's not because of my Scottish accent, it is because of the one bottle of Bex that I've had. Um, I, I want to talk about, um, thinking about the, the mainstream of what we're looking at today, um, sport, diplomacy and governance. My own research which has been on the, the Commonwealth Games and the Commonwealth Games movement and, and I guess how, as we do pivot towards uh, a post-Brexit era, how the Commonwealth Games and the Commonwealth as a, a geopolitical entity might be an avenue which we might pursue um, as a way of, of securing diplomacy and power for the UK uh, in the, kind of the, the future climate. Um, but also to consider why that might be a very bad idea as well um, for numerous different reasons, which um, colleagues touched upon earlier on today uh, during our, our roundtable discussions, but I, I'll try and recapture uh, this evening as well. Um, I asked, asked Simon asked me to do any introductions, but I said I have a slide on uh, some blatant self-indulgence, and I, I literally do. Um, just, but I, I want to kind of talk about this to kind of give you, I guess, a sense of how possibly my work in the games might feed into some of those elements there. I, I completed not too long ago a, a PhD on the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games, but particularly how that was linked to um, the political symbolism uh, of that moment in time in Scotland, uh, where it was literally weeks before the independence referendum, and how 
uh, an event, a pre-existing event could be used for um, political means. Um, someone mentioned earlier on today during the, the round table about the SNP thought of this about the Games, but they actually got, by luck, it was Labour who got bid for the Games in 2007 with a political system designed in Scotland to never let there be a nationalist majority, um, which failed. Uh, and it then gave an opportunity for uh, the SNP to potentially use that Games for, for political ends. And when that happened, many moons aligned for me in terms of PhD thesis, an interest in sport, but nationalism, politics, um, and particularly secessionist and nationalist politics as well. Um, and what I did is I, I looked at the political discourse, but interestingly, I, I talked to politicians themselves about what they were saying about the games and what that meant. And that was the most fascinating thing for me, was actually talking to the people saying these statements and asking, did you really believe what you're saying about these elements there as well? Um, and, and thinking about diplomacy, what this game's meant about Scotland and Scotland's unique status within the UK and what that meant as a, a platform for Scotland to almost um, act as a, a pre-nation state actor on the global stage as well. And I'll touch upon that a little bit later on. Um, and then um, I've got some stuff today about the, the Commonwealth Games movement more broadly and how diplomacy and governments and kind of the real politic of the Commonwealth uh, fed together, um, which, which I'll, I'll touch upon briefly. Um, but the, the, the kind of third one down under the publications is, is one which I think is relevant. Um, a collaboration with a colleague, at Jack, Black, uh, Jack Black at Sheffield Hallam, which looked at the media and the symbolism of uh, the 2014 Games and how that was represented on different sides of the, the political agenda and what that meant, uh, particular reflections about what the, the Commonwealth and the Empire meant. And uh, on the, the kind of more rightly in newspapers, how the Empire was looked at through kind of rose-tinted spectacles, whereas on the left, a little bit more self-awareness about uh, the fact that the Empire was not something to be celebrated, was not something to be proud of. Um, and again, that feeds forward into uh, possibly the possibilities of using the Games for diplomacy in the future. Um, and also looking at how um, Scottish politicians in the Working Group for Scottish Sport thought that sport might be, uh, for an independent Scotland, a, a kind of tool to be leveraged to kind of give Scotland some status uh, in the broader world. Uh, and I've currently kind of moved forward looking at the 2018 Games with a colleague from Southampton Solent, looking at how that has been framed within uh, promotional and political narratives, uh, and looking at also um, the, the, the case of Catalonia and how sport plays a role there in terms of nationalist politics, diplomacy, and things along those lines. So in many ways, when, when this event and this invite came along, uh, and Verity asked me to pull some, some ideas together in it, uh, a lot of my, my past stuff, whilst I've not framed it explicitly within a discussion of diplomacy governance, has been resonating with a lot of those ideas in different ways. Um, and the Commonwealth Games is, uh, I use the phrase second order mechanism in the title today, um, and I draw upon David Black's work there where he says that um, we compare it to the, the mega events, the, the World Cups and the Olympics of this world, the Commonwealth Games is, is only limited in its impact. And um, we have um, colleagues from outside of the Commonwealth who, when you explain, when I explained what my PhD was on, they would say the Commonwealth what? Um, and you would have to give a little bit of contextual explanation of what that meant. And it is a second order event, but that means that it's available to different nations, uh, different regions, um, for different purposes as well. Um, but it has its own unique politics and its own unique political movement. And we, what we see, in our, if we kind of look at the sweep of time, is, I guess, a, a de-empiring of the, the Commonwealth Games and its symbolism, uh, moving away from this idea of it being the British Empire Games uh, towards the Commonwealth. And um, I think we can all, all kind of sense the kind of softening of that phrase from empire to Commonwealth. Um, where, and that does reflect the, the kind of political... Uh, relationships between the member states and the member nations of the Commonwealth, but is that again something symbolic rather than something um, honest and reflective uh, in terms of that move there? Um, the, the games have been used for diplomatic means in the past. The, the best example is um, the apartheid regime in South Africa and how the games was used by, by various different actors um, to leverage uh, and to impact upon the nature of the, the South African state. Um, so where that be barred in South Africa from the, the Games Federation, um, the, the, the Glen Eagles Agreement, which actually about six or seven years later was used to make sure the Games could continue as a movement because of the threatened boycotts uh, at that time. And effectively, why those boycotts um, did come to fruition in the 1996 Games uh, in my, my hometown of Edinburgh, where we did have um, a boycott, an actual boycott, 
boycott of, from some Caribbean, um, Asian and African nations, um, which left the games looking um, somewhat sparse and somewhat white, would be fair to say, if you actually looked at what actually happened in terms of how the games looked to, to the outsider. Since that, since that time, and I, I refuse to use a particular phrase, uh, which talks about, which has been used a lot to talk about how games and events have been used, um, but I'll use the phrase image promotion and, and future event springboarding um, to kind of say that moving away from this kind of traditional sense of, of diplomacy and actually pressurising nations to change their rules, we're kind of moving towards in the games, as we have with the Olympics and other uh, mega sporting events, a shift towards using it as uh, an image projection, um, promotion and, and looking towards something bigger. And I think an element of that came into the, the 2014 games. Um, but whether or not that was something about Scotland or something about Glasgow, I'll try and touch upon uh, briefly in a second. Um, but again, we've seen the games being used for that. Kuala Lumpur, a perfect example, Delhi 2010. Uh, a shift away from the White Dominions in terms of hosting, uh, which has traditionally been the case, apart from Kuala Lumpur, Delhi uh, and the Kingston games. Um, but what we're seeing now, uh, particularly with the stripping of the, the 2022 games from Durban and it being returned or re, re, re kind of distributed to Birmingham, we've seen a, a recurring dominance of the White Dominions. And we've seen that in the last few games. The games have gone from being something which is about the entire Commonwealth. If you look at the hosting patterns, it is the White Dominion nations which dominate it in terms of hosting, but also more broadly in terms of uh, the medals and the events that, which are within there. And I question whether or not, with this grand sweep of time, whilst we might have seen symbolic gestures about um, the, the moving away from the, the, the UK and the, the White Dominions to the rest of the Commonwealth in terms of distribution, I think that's maybe more tokenism rather than uh, in terms of reality. Um, so moving on to, to Glasgow 2014 and, and my own interest in that there as well. Um, talking, to, um, talking to politicians, but also most of the academic reflections on that, um, came up with five main kind of real goals. And I think the first three really linked to this idea of diplomacy and, and governance. And I'll touch on the governance thing now that um, this was Scotland's games, but also Glasgow's games. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of to and fro and about who, who took the credit for it. Was it the UK government? I, I think most people would say probably not. Was it the Scottish government led by the SNP? But in Glasgow, a Labour-led council government who really <coughs> kind of really were the ones who maybe put their, their kind of they're next to the grindstone and really pushing things forward in the Glasgow area. So there's some tensions there about that. Um, but in many ways, it kind of shows the SNP's approach to re regeneration, using sport as a, a way of driving things forward, and particularly in the east end of Glasgow, a fairly deprived area as well. But in, in terms of diplomacy, what they did almost try and do as well is do a bit of image projection and tourism promotion. Uh, Glasgow, for those of you who don't know Glasgow very well, has got a bit of a bad reputation in terms of its city. The, the main streets of Glasgow is the way it's often kind of thought of. Uh, and, and a lot of the idea behind it was to change that, that the idea about what Glasgow was uh, as an events destination. And they've had a number of sporting events uh, as part of their kind of economic uh, regeneration of Glasgow in a kind of de-industrial era there as well. But the SNP government also wanted to use it as a way of kind of... Um, diplomatically presenting themselves almost as a nation in waiting as well. We are ready in this kind of pre-referendum era to be ready to be a, a global actor, to be able to be on the same, uh, the same par, the same platform as the rest of the Commonwealth nations. Um, we had the usual rhetoric and, and legacy of a sporting, um, a sporting participation boost, this kind of trickle-down uh, economics or trickle-down uh, expectation that elite level sport will lead to tackling the health disparities in Glasgow. Uh, again, the usual um, the usual rhetoric and nonsense was spouted about that. And well, four years down the line, we know that's absolutely a, a total fallacy. But I won't talk about that today because um, I only have a limited amount of time. Um, and But this is what they talked about. And, and um, <laughs> forgive me for this, but I, I want to share my misery with you. I spent a lot of time going through speech transcripts, press releases, and all the rest of it, to see the kind of narratives and the, and the merits uh, of what was being said. And at the top, the, the main thing they talked about, there's going to be a sporting legacy, and this is the SNP's spin and what the games meant. We're going to have this sporting legacy and that sporting legacy. Economics not far behind, though. And really, for me, if you talk about the benefit of a, an event, if you just talk about the economics elements of it, I'll give you that. I will say, yes, there is an economic boost. There is some return pound for pound in what you spend. Sporting, I disagree with. But third down in, in the, the dark blue, um, 
a major thing was about Scotland's profile and reputation, um, showcasing Glasgow and Scotland in that order, Glasgow first, Scotland after. And that was quite important to kind of share the credit. But international relations and diplomacy um, was an often uh, a key element there as well, talking about how it allowed Scotland to build diplomatic links with their Commonwealth brothers and sisters and, and friends and, and the friendly games. Um, particularly, a lot of emphasis on Malawi. Scotland has a formal uh, diplomatic relationship and an aid relationship with Malawi, um, and that was also one was emphasised quite a lot there as well. Again, going back to some of Simon's comments earlier on about state actors in diplomacy, Scotland almost trying to act as a state in waiting and act diplomatically in that kind of way. Um, moving on to the Gold Coast, and I, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to I kind of finish up on, on this slide before opening to some questions and some thoughts. Um, we, we see something different in, in Australia. Um, similar, similar in the sense of governance in that you've got this tension between, in Scotland, the devolved government of Scotland and the UK state government. In Australia, you have the, the federal government and then the state governments. And we have the same tension of Queensland wanting to claim credit for the Games versus the Australian federal government wanting to claim credit. And again, contrasting political parties, a Labour-led uh, government in Queensland versus a Liberal-led, uh, Liberal-national-led government uh, coming from Canberra. Um, and again, we kind of see some of those elements come to play there as well. Um, this is being used to boost a particular area. Um, if anyone's had the pleasure of travelling down the, the east coast of, of Australia to Surfers Paradise, it was a stop-off on your way to somewhere better. Um, yes, it was a fantastic place, a beautiful place, but it seemed like a little bit of Americana um, in, on this kind of beautiful part, and then you went down to Sydney or you moved from Brisbane to somewhere else. And they want to make people stick, not just as tourism, but as investment and, and all the rest there as well. So again, we're kind of seeing the games being again framed in that way. Looking forward to Birmingham 2022, we see exactly the same rhetoric coming about uh, Birmingham 2022 and what that's going to do to Birmingham, but the West Midlands area uh, more broadly as well. And the strap line where anything is possible, optimism and positive energy of the Gold Coast. You can kind of get away with that a little bit more uh, in Australia than you can in Glasgow uh, in terms of uh, optimism and energy. Glaswegians are, are actually, to be fair, I'm from Edinburgh, they're a lot more positive and optimistic than we are. Um, but um, you, you, with the sunshine and all the rest, you can get those elements there as well. But, and, and uh, this was alluded to earlier on um, during today as well, but we kind of see this kind of pivot in Australia diplomatically. They, they're not looking at the UK. They're not thinking about us. They're thinking about China. Uh, I was informed um, by um, by Claire. We're, they're looking at India. Um, they're looking at America. They're looking at the Pacific and Asian countries. They're not looking to really build strong trade relationships with the UK. Yes, they will want them, but really, are we are we the big fish? And and as we then think about um, going forward in the Commonwealth Games and our status as UK within there. Um, do we do we over egg our status within the Commonwealth uh, and our status internationally there as well? Um, on on Birmingham twenty twenty two, and I'll kind of leave on this point because I'm conscious I am rambling. Um, Birmingham twenty twenty two, the the West Midlands Mayor came out and said this will be an opportunity uh, to show what post Brexit Britain is all about. Um, and for for me who leans towards the Remain side of things, that's not necessarily a good a good thought about what four years will look like. But I, I, there's been this pivot away from a, a major trading partner and political ally in the EU going back to embrace the Commonwealth. Um, and, and I just can't see the Commonwealth want to embrace us back in the same way. I don't think that we have been a good leader of that organisation historically. I don't think we've done always good things for those nations. Um, will they want to embrace us in the way they want us to embrace? Um, that is, that's a question which is open. Um, and I think... As you look towards Birmingham 2022, those will be some of the key arguments being being had in the key trading discussions. And, and Gavin touched upon it earlier on about um, about what the trade relationships might be coming from the transition from Gold Coast 2018 to Birmingham 2022. And the UK will be very keen to do that. But will we be banging our head against a brick wall? Um, I'm not sure. Time will tell. So I'll, I'll leave it on that kind of um, that open open ended um, non non-judgmental statement in many ways um, and uh, ask if there's uh, any questions. Thank you.
take our questions at the end. Ah, oh, excellent. Grant, so, thank you. I can so that's your beer. Yes. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and now I'm going to ask um, my colleague Jay uh, to speak. So I shall put his slides up there. <coughs> Yeah, over to you. No need for a grand introduction. Uh, All right, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Liverpool fan. So if you're Everton fan, this is please you bear with me. Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, well, wh while I was uh, um, uh, having a lobby uh, trekking in uh, Yosemite National Park the last week, and I was out of the internet, and then. When I got this, the first email uh, in the civilized world, I got this email from Verity and saying I'm giving a talk uh, as a keynote speaker with <laughs> along with the uh, theater. I had a thought is that the Simon will give a talk and I will chair. <laughs> that was the original idea. So if you found that it's, uh, my uh, talk is a little bit sloppy, please blame Simon. Um, his email address is SM or something like that. <laughs> Okay, um, but I, I a little bit tried to uh, uh, fill up, and then so you can see a little bit of uh, my talk as a footnote, as well as a slightly different approach to the mega events from the perspective of uh, media studies and um, sociology of culture. I'm currently working on the, um, the assessment of the legacy of the PyeongChang Olympics commissioned by the South Korean government, so especially focusing on the cultural program as well. So I'd like to a little bit give you what actually happened during the, the PyeongChang Olympics in February and how this is uh, actually doing the, the follow-up uh, in terms of uh, the inter-Korean uh, uh, dialogue and especially North and, and, and US uh, summit is ahead. So um, I'd like to say a little bit uh, on uh, in terms of the PyeongChang Olympics uh, with reference to spectacle of sporting mega events, which uh, Stuart actually wrote in in detail. So this morning, and when I was uh, 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 woke up, is uh, again there's a breaking news. Is uh, the uh, CIA director, uh, Michael Pompeo, actually made a secret trip to North Korea, and then had actually highest to talk with the uh, with the North Korean leader, maybe Kim Jong Un. So. It's really a flurry of the fast diplomacy, uh, the uh, communications and affairs that are taking place. But, but if it's not the first time actually it's the North Korea and South, uh, the United States have tried to make some kind of bridge and the intercommunication between two parties. In uh, 1994, uh, the former president, this is Jimmy Carter, actually made the first visit to Pyongyang and met the then leader and the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung. And then in 2000, uh, 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 then uh, Secretary of uh, uh, State um, uh, Albright has made a trip to Pyongyang to actually uh, ease the tension about this uh, bombing on the Pyongyang by the Clinton uh, administration. And then actually the, the uh, discussion went very well, and then they, was, uh, they were uh, planning to make a deal about this, uh, changing this uh, 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 ceasefire treaty uh, a truce into uh, the peace uh, uh, agreement. So that's the big deal for the, not just about the denuclearizing uh, North Korea, but actually normalizing North Korea and then bring it into the international uh, communication, uh, international network. And in 2009, also President, uh, former President uh, the Bill Clinton visited Pyongyang and then tried to, uh, uh, to make a, a better progress the relationship between two countries. But when uh, in 2000, Albright, after Albright's visit to Pyongyang, it is, uh, George Bush was elected, so whole uh, those uh, discussions stopped. And, and then following, following these uh, Bush administrations, and even the Obama administration, the whole the, the relationship between North Korea and United States it didn't work very well. The point I'd like to make is why North Korea wanted to actually participate in PyeongChang Olympics and why they suddenly need to have a conversation with the United States. What's this kind of the context? One thing is that the North Korea is desperately need to change the situation, especially these uh, peace treaties. So we, we need to a little bit focus on that. Then what's the impact of the PyeongChang Olympics on this whole change? Suddenly, we didn't actually expect this massive and this sudden change. If you would, a little bit look back this uh, last year, and there is a, when whole this uh, 
nuclear uh, the test took place, especially in the continental uh, ballistic missile uh, system, uh, the test took place a few times in 2017. And then um, UN sanctions actually uh, was implemented again. And you may remember very well, it's clearly, <coughs> you believe, so Donald Trump said his uh, militant solutions are now fully in place. It was uh, the August last year and followed by October. And then it's, uh, they, they, they are warming up before this. And then calling there's uh, Kim Jong-un as a rocket man. There is, uh, they are really trying to uh, do the verbal war and the warming up. And so it was very, uh, the, uh, as a Korean, it was, what on earth is going on? Are they, are they really serious? And is, uh, what are you talking about in terms of uh, diplomacy here? Is, uh, when you talk about this security between two countries, they, they, it's kind of the Armageddon atmosphere. But well, that was just a few, few months ago. And all the Western media were really is a keen to, uh, to, to find out what's going on between two countries. But suddenly in February, it is, uh, the North Korea made a phone call to uh, South Korea in the demilitarized zone for the first time since uh, after eight years. And then, and then they uh, sent uh, the, the sister of the, uh, Kim Jong-un. And then whole uh, it uh, started. And it is uh, those whole this, uh, I think reconnection between South and North Koreans and the discussions resumed in February. And as you can uh, uh, remember, this, uh, they made a march together between North and South Koreans under the reunified the symbolic flag and then showing the world that they are actually uh, trying to make a progress. So the Pyeongchang Olympics, this is a, uh, yeah, this is a lot of criticism about this, uh, uh, about there's economic and political impact, but there is uh, in terms of this whole political and, and diplomatic, uh, the rewards, it was absolutely worth for those whole uh, issues. And as you can see it in the, it was very deliberately made a, a, an effort to, to show the world that this North and South Korea are uh, uh, working together and collaborating to ease in the tension in the peninsula. And then these are the last uh, penultimate uh, torch uh, uh, bearer of two, uh, uh, hockey players between uh, and from North and South Korea, and then they made a the joint team for female ice hockey teams. And then, well, they lost all games, but they scored once. So that was a brilliant moment as well. It is a, that was the moment. It is a, we we didn't expect this to win any games, but it's a, just one goal. They they will cheer it up. So they did it. So and then it's a Paralympics. Uh, on the other hand, it is a, they marched separately. Uh, and for some other reasons, we can come back to that. Well, so as you can see the, in the opening ceremony, there's uh, uh, the uh, actual uh, symbolic, uh, the chairman of the North Korean uh, Republic, and there's a sister of the Kim Jong-un who is actually delivering uh, the letter to President Moon from Kim Jong-un. And well, it's uh, the, the vice president of the Pence was actually completely ignoring this in North Korea together with Abe. So you can see this is a, uh, the, the tensions between North Korea and other countries like the United States and Japan are very evident still in the opening ceremony. So you can see there is a, a very conflictual relationship between South and North Korea and the Japan and, and the United States are more complicated than we can now think about uh, in terms of six-party talks of, around this uh, nuclear weapons uh, issues. After the, uh, this is the, the closing ceremony, and uh, the United States send uh, uh, Ms. Ivanka Trump, <laughs> maybe got some idea they should send a little bit better diplomatic figure than Pence, because who represent the more hawks, and there is a hard line uh, on there is a dealing with the nuclear uh, issue in uh, North Korea. On the other hand, North Korea sent a military uh, figure to the South Korea, saying, "Well, we send the first time, and it's more soft power. Now we have also hard power too." So it's actually quite. Uh, this was the mayor of the Beijing who will host the Beijing 2022. So uh, 
it shows some kind of the very uh, complicated but uh, uh, straightforward message to the world from North Korea. Is, uh, we, we, we are ready to have a talk, but also we are not quite uh, 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 willing to, to, to give up all the military power yet. So it shows this a while, it is a, this is a diplomatic war between North Korea and United States. Actually, during the Pyeongchang Olympics, is there probably North Korea scored a little bit more than United States. Well, besides the sports diplomacy, uh, there have been a lot of the cultural exchange between South Korea and North Korea during and after the Pyeongchang Olympics. So North Korean cultural delegation visited South Korea for the first time since uh, early 2000, and they uh, made the whole performances together at the, in the, uh, during the performance they, again there's a uh, the sister of Kim Jong Un um, had a quite a show the, and then and displayed very friendly communication uh, uh, with the President Moon in South Korea. So symbolically uh, it, it displayed a lot of progress and developed the relationship between two countries. In return, South Korea sent their uh, cultural uh, uh, delegation to North Korea uh, early April, and then it was in Pyeong Pyongyang, not Pyeongchang, I mean <laughs> Pyongyang, uh, the, uh, the concert hall, and then uh, was the, uh, the popular and the shocking and scene was the, one of the K-pop girl group um, Red Velvet, which is one of my favorite groups as well. Uh, <laughs> actually, this was such an absolutely brilliant, brilliant performances, but it's a little bit toned down, a little bit more it's, uh, tailor-made, uh, the North Korean style, uh, the performances, right? not as usual K-pop girl group performances, which I'm a little bit disappointed with. But. Uh, we, could, we could push a little bit into to white sand we can go further, but it's, uh, they are wearing the black, and it is, uh, so as you can imagine. Kim Jong-un uh, 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 went to the, uh, the performances, and then afterward had a chat with the, the whole big K-pop uh, stars, and then had a big photo opportunity. So suddenly, uh, Former true administration of South Korea over the last eight, nine years, uh, there were absolutely no significant communications between North and South. And that now two presidents of South Korea are in jail. Am I embarrassed? No, I'm very proud actually to send them to the prison. But suddenly this whole liberalization of South Korea also actually opened us the, uh, the door to North Korea. So that's another inter-Korean political context along with the um, uh, international political context. So these two uh, former uh, presidents, uh, the Kim Dae-jung, uh, Nobel laureate, and then is a uh, president to role. Uh, Kim Dae-jung first made a visit to Pyongyang in 2000 and under the, uh, the auspicious of the Sunshine Policies to invite North Korea into the global order and then how they can actually ease the tension. And they actually talked very well, but and then uh, the following um, the president's role also made another step forward to visit uh, North Korea and then they made a certain uh, uh, mutual uh, agreement about the reserve uh, uh, easing this tension, especially the military tensions uh, around this the demilitarized zone. And as you can see, over the last 10 years, there was no actual uh, the noticeable and uh, significant communications between two. And then uh, next week, 27th of April, the two will meet in the military zone for the first time after and 2007. So, the uh, one of key agenda, uh, and also the most important agenda they are now setting up is uh, how they can actually make sure there is a uh, ceasefire treaty in truth into the peace treaties, and how it, it can be carried out into the next big uh, summit between uh, North Korea and United States, because the actual stakeholder and actually signatories are between North Korea and United States, not between North and South Koreas about this uh, 
satisfy the truth. So it should be uh, conducted by North Korea and United States. So South Korea actually serving and playing a role as a mediator desperately and then trying to turn it around. Well, the, the role of the sports during this, uh, the, uh, the Pyeongchang Olympics can a little bit cynically represented by the uh, Western media in terms of there's more manipulated, there's untruthful, trusty word in North Korean uh, uh, strategies, or we can say they are really trying to a little bit uh, uh, to make a difference between two countries, uh, the relationship maybe is normalizing North Korea. But I will leave it to those whole more details to you expert. Well, so it was March 9th of a uh, few weeks ago, North Korean uh, leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. Uh, President Donald Trump was, uh, uh, so made a sudden announcement there, uh, actual meeting in probably in June or earlier, according to this, uh, Donald Trump today. Uh, so there was a whole process surrounding the uh, Pyeongchang Olympics uh, very uh, evidently displayed and showed that actually there is uh, this mega event, whether it's uh, the media spectacle or political spectacle, uh, made a massive contribution to turning around these uh, tensions between North Korea and other countries, especially South Korea and United States. So having said so, I'd like to say uh, what could be then is uh, the, the context of the mega event in East Asia. So that's the last part I'd like to a little bit uh, say a few words. Well, mega events in East Asia is always kind of the big uh, uh, emblem of the modernization, how they can actually expedite the modernization by this, uh, taking a big risk of the urban uh, the policies and implementing the new economic uh, 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 directions and the political democratizations and so on and so on. But as you can see, this is Tokyo 1964. Actually, Japan was awarded to host one in the 1940s, which was uh, as cancelled in the, over there in the Second World War. And then Seoul Olympic took place in 1988, Beijing 2008. So this shows this uh, North, it's Eastern Asian modernization through mega events, especially sports mega events of the Olympics. And that World Cup uh, was hosted by Korea Japan, which also uh, facilitated the big uh, this mutual understanding between two uh, very uh, hostile relationship as uh, Japan is the more uh, former uh, colonizer and the Korea as uh, uh, colonies. Uh, this is how they actually uh, uh, make this uh, progress through the World Cup as was a big issues at the time. Uh, the uh, the Suter uh, briefly mentioned about the mega events. Maybe we can say that the mega event in terms of the three big uh, uh, events such as the FIFA World Cup and IOC uh, run Olympics, but also the the World Exhibition could be the, the very traditionally the big mega events as well. But as the mega events uh, uh, increasingly becomes more media events, it is the mega the the, the industrial uh, expert, which uh, used to be a big um, the symbol of the technology and progress, became a little bit marginalized, and then and, and their impact on uh, the global society is uh, uh, increasingly smaller and smaller. But in the 70s and 80s, Osaka uh, Expo also dealt with the, uh, the, uh, the technology uh, and industrial societies. And so Korea also hosted one. And the Shanghai 2010 also showed the completion of Chinese way of the modernization in terms of the mega events. So, so maybe um, Xi Jinping is a big fan of the football, so he uh, is willing to very much so to uh, to host uh, probably 2026, 20, uh, it will be done, so 2030, I guess, that's the Chinese beat, coming back to Asia. Uh, in terms of uh, smaller scale of the winter games, Japan hosted twice and Pyeongchang, and then Beijing 2022. So this is the second round of the Eastern Asian modernity in terms of the mega events. At, and it's the Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing are done. And then uh, the Pyeongchang 2018 through Tokyo 2020 
to 2020 to Beijing Winter Olympics. This is a second stage of their uh, modernity. So uh, another question raised uh, concerns why this, uh, uh, this Eastern countries, such as Japan as the most industrial advanced uh, the countries needs another mega event at this stage. Well, because it's uh, well, quite similar uh, region to this, uh, London 2012 as that uh, reurbanization and rehabilitation of very, uh, very much outdated uh, uh, urban areas such as the East London here, but Tokyo uh, also needs to, uh, well, not gentrification, but it's a need to rehabilitate the East Tokyo area, but also the politically they need to change their image since the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And then that's how it can be related uh, Japanese uh, uh, Abe administrations, uh, 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 their hope to uh, actually change their uh, uh, national security role into the more normal state law. So that's the, a little bit of the East Asian context of mega events. Um, maybe I should a little bit uh, finish up now. Uh, what well, I've been working on is the South Korean context of the mega events, but it's, uh, as, I can, as I said, it's a uh, in terms of the, uh, the spectacle, we need to a little bit uh, uh, look into the very specific and particular context of mega events rather than generalizing and, 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 and characterizing them in terms of the more uh, or overall general uh, uh, features. So I've uh, been working on the uh, analyzing Seoul Olympics in terms of the spectacle, but it's more like uh, focusing on their political democratization in 1980s, and after the whole long uh, period of military dictatorships in South Korea, they tried to uh, show off to the world as the part of the developing countries and democratically uh, uh, stable countries into the world. And then in 2002 World Cup, a little bit different spectacle was uh, more uh, manipulated and then distributed in terms of more post-industrial high-tech society and then how this more consumer culture actually is uh, more articulated and developed through these mega events. So then PyeongChang Olympics at a slightly uh, smaller scale, but I would like to see this, uh, as I uh, a little bit earlier mentioned, this more geopolitical issues and combined by their the more uh, high-tech digital culture, uh, the articulate is a spectacle of the PyeongChang Olympics. Well, it's kind of the Eastern Asian context in terms of the collective unities in, and, and to articulate and then show this uh, national identity that you can very easily pick up uh, as well. So let me just uh, wrap it up. So the how we can analyze those media spectacle in a more systematic way is that we apply the, the idea of the Olympic Games impact factors of uh, the uh, presented by the IOC in 2006, and then this kind of tripartite indexes uh, as well, uh, social, cultural, and, and economic dimensions. So I'm particularly uh, working on this more cultural uh, program during the Olympics and after uh, the Olympics in terms of the legacies. Let me just to finish it is a uh, not only just the uh, North South and in the United States relationship in terms of diplomacy, but I was very much uh, struck and by this uh, whole those athletes is uh, the very mature and very peaceful gesture about the competition and the victories. So this is the uh, after the final round of the five thousand one uh, the speed skating, and then South Korean actually is a big. Uh, 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 name actually failed, Yi Sang Hwa failed to win the third gold in a row. She actually won the silver and then uh, the Japanese skater who always uh, lost to her over the last 10 years won it at the end, but actually the sh rather than showing off for her this uh, over excitement, she actually concerned and then is a, uh, the heart and the color that is her, her arch driver, which showed is uh, South and then South, and, and Jap South Korean and Japanese relationships are also getting into the very different stage uh, as well. So it's not only political and the state level of communication through mega events, but from the below, the sportsmen and athletes, but also kind of the civil engagement and, and then uh, society, civil society is very much involved in this whole mega events 
uh, the communication and as well. So that's what the point I'd like to say. Okay, then, Thank, Thank you very, you much. very much. Yeah. Yeah. convene a uh, panel discussion, so if I could invite uh, Tom and Charlie to, uh, to come along too. Gentlemen, have a seat. Um, I'm sure there's much there that is of uh, interest to you as it was to me. Um, we've been joined on the panel by uh, two of my, I say my, that's very possessive, <laughs> two uh, of SOAS's uh, sport diplomacy students from this last uh, session. I'll just give them a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, yeah. uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Shweta. I'm from India, and I moved into the UK last year to do my master's in international studies and diplomacy. And um, I've been learning a lot about sporting events, and I can't wait for this uh, discussion to start. Thank you so much. Hi, um, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Charlie. Um, I'm the same degree program as, as Shweta, doing international studies and diplomacy. Um, I was on Simon O'Verity's sport and diplomacy course this year, um, which has been really, really interesting and fascinating. Um, yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for introducing yourself. Um, so I asked them to provide some sort of questions and reflections on Stu and Jay's uh, presentations to uh, get the ball rolling. So, um, ladies, over to you. While well, you're busy gestating and thinking of questions of your own. So. Don't start. Me, good job. Thanks. <laughs> to you, to me, to you. No. <laughs> Thanks, Rector. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for um, your thoughts, um, both of you. Um, it's a very different perspectives, both of them, on how, um, well, I thought, anyway, different but related, um, on how sporting events can be um, kind of a platform for the discussion of kind of wider issues. So kind of my notes from um, Stuart's talk about the Commonwealth, I he noted down he used um, the phrase of de-empiring of the Commonwealth Games, so moving from the Empire Games to, to the Commonwealth Games and how that's like a softening of the phrase, but is it really a softening of kind of the whole notion of of the Empire, really? Um, and I was, guess a question to ask later. Um, <coughs> so whether you think that's going to become um, the whole the Commonwealth Games or the Commonwealth, you think that's going to become defunct in the future um, if it's the kind of the lasting relic of the Commonwealth is the Commonwealth Games. Is that ever? Is that going to continue? Do you think? Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, feel free. Hopefully, that's working. Um, it's it almost was for a long period of time. I think the games was all that was left of of the Commonwealth, and and I guess symbolically and internationally. And whether or not that that will change going forward it will depend upon how much the Commonwealth, I think, are ready to embrace their old imperial masters is is um is ultimately that that's what that's what the commonwealth meant um i think to in order to do that i think the the uk and great britain needs to really reflect upon that role and, and not just symbolically but but honestly and, and be ready to trade as equals um and actually in many ways maybe think about reparating some of the things that haven't happened in the past um and we, we talked earlier today about whether or not that would happen and um I'm doubtful it will, so possibly it would just be the games are symbolic gesture. And I, I used the phrase second order mechanism earlier on to talk about the games, but also I think the Commonwealth is maybe a second order organisation and, and that could drop off the radar. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but my fear is unless we change our tack, the games would be all, the only thing for that, yeah. Uh, before I ask my my uh, question, like I just want to say that I've... I personally learned a lot from this, uh, from these two presentations, especially about the um, uh, unification of the two Koreas. And um, my question to Mr. Uh, Ajeho is: um, Do you think sport will uh, dominate over international uh, relations in the near future, or will it be the other way around? Um, I hope so. Um, um, the, before the Pyeongchang Olympics, there was a couple of uh, the uh, attempt to form the unified teams. In the Sydney Olympics, they marched together. In 1990, they also played the ping pong 
as a unified team, and they won the gold uh, against China, mighty China. So I think it boosted the national pride and optimistic uh, the uh, emotion, emotional uh, response to those whole sports spectacle, and sports uh, definitely serve as a soft power and as a cultural power too. So I hope it is that uh, the sports can actually uh, made a much more contribution to this uh, very harsh political issues, but. Because is a, another danger is the sports is also very emotionally uh, and effective communication. Therefore, sometimes it can be uh, uh, the, utilized for some other reasons as well. So maybe it is uh, we need to see both parts of the the sports as the, the cultural power. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, um, just didn't say about the. So thank you for your your thoughts on, on Korea. Um, so, see, we've talked a lot about the Pyeongchang Games um, in our class this semester. It's been a very timely um, event for our class. Um, so we watched the opening ceremony, and we kind of it's a very symbolic gesture. The two Koreas kind of marching in, in together. Um, but the only thing that I kind of wonder about it is whether um, that yes, this, the event has been a good platform for the two Koreas to show um, kind of unification, to to march together in, in solidarity, or to open this this political dialogue. Um, but do you think that, that they used the Pyeongchang Games because of the timing, because um, it was a convenient time for the, this to happen, um, or do you think it was a conscious effort that um, either South Korea or North Korea will use sport as a diplomatic tool um, moving forward as well? Um, the Pyeongchang Olympics was initially set and then and actually pursued by uh, previous governments, not this government. So it was a kind of a big issue. Why uh, Korea, which already is a graduate from the developing stage of the uh, the nation, need another big mega events in the middle of nowhere in northeast Korea, and also costing <coughs> massive uh, the uh, destruction of that is a very much is a uh, ecologically important area too. So there was a massive development and then a real estate development and um, those uh, urbanizing issues in that area. And then those two government, uh, previous uh, administrations were very keen to, to develop those areas rather than actual inter-Korean relationships or diplomacies. So suddenly this new government, which actually uh, was scheduled to uh, come to the power later last year, I'm sorry, the this year uh, needed to to uh, uh, come into the uh, the power because the, the former president was impeached. So they needed to turn around. There is a, not as an actual earlier government plan to develop those areas, but for the more symbolic relationship between in, uh, inter-Korean uh, dialogue. So that that's actually uh, happened within a few 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 months times. So that that shows how. What was your next question? Sorry, is that the <laughs> <laughs> so that was the win, and then how, how afterward how this legacy can be uh, sustained and maintained and, uh, as well. If it will be sustained through sport diplomacy, or yeah, exactly. So not as just one of uh, the issues. So the uh, my colleagues would like to uh, actually uh, make a formal suggestion to make it more regular. Uh, exchange uh, between North and South Koreas, and especially is uh, the football matches between uh, Pyongyang and Seoul, which uh, started to uh, uh, hold this event in in 1920s. This is kind of the hundred years ago. There was a regular football matches between Pyongyang and Seoul on the Japanese college. Of course, it's, uh, the British Empire introduced uh, the football to South Korea. I'm not it's Korea. Is that, thanks very much. And then. Uh, uh, under uh, the industrialization of the Japanese Im imperialism, uh, uh, all the metropolitan and big cities like Pyongyang and Korea also uh, started to form various uh, the, uh, uh, amateur though, but clubs, and then they had a very serious uh, regular uh, matches. So they would like to resume this uh, the whole regular exchange in terms of sports and culture after the Pyongyang Olympics. So I wish. They could a little bit, and it would depend on how coming to summits will go.
I think that last point speaks to what um, you know, the, uh, one of the old bastions of uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, Richelieu would talk about the moments in time, the right moment for um, negotiation, you know, finding the right time as being you know, the really critical thing. So it would, the wrong time is the, is the problem. Um, questions, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure there's much that one could uh, ask, and if you don't, I will. <laughs> Ian. So I guess in terms of support for diplomacy, does it matter? Does anybody even care? Care or about the fact that at the Paralympic Games they didn't march together? Uh, the, the, the key issue was that it was the first time North Korean Paralympic actually uh, participated the first time. So they would like to uh, use this uh, uh, opportunity as a symbolic uh, uh, to display as well. So South Korea wanted to a little bit show the consistency of this uh, more uh, friendly relationships, but they accepted it. And of course, it's, uh, the people were very much concerned. Uh, uh, Paralympic wasn't as successful as the, the Olympics in, in, in Pyeongchang, but uh, given the whole the earlier engagement of South Korean uh, culture of sports, the, the Paralympic also made a massive impact on the, the new understanding and the perception of the disabled disabilities and the social welfare system in South Korea. So it was quite huge as well. Has that actually been measured empirically or is that just a feeling? Well, the, the, the Olympic game impact studies by Korean government was published two years ago before the Olympics. And then now third, uh, the uh, the report is is now uh, being carried out, and then we expect how we can measure. And then there was a discussion so far, and then it's a, what kind of the methodology can be uh, applied. So so far we've been discussing it, and then um, the there was a very tough issue about the disabilities and the social welfare system in North Korea, in South Korea. <laughs> but uh, we expect to start the the analysis of the legacy will be published within a few months' times. And does that apply equally to the Paralympics? Yeah. Okay. So they've tried to do the same monitoring and evaluation experience? Yeah, there are a couple of uh, uh, issues raised through the re evaluation of the, uh, the previous index system of the IOC because uh, uh, Diplomacy issues between neighboring countries were not very much a significant actual index in this whole uh, uh, the Olympic Games impact study because it's more focused on the domestic and international scale, but not particularly a uh, uh, few uh, engaging countries, such as in the North South uh, the Korea's uh, relationship were absolutely unexpected and massive than expected. So that how we can actually uh, more systematically apply this factor into this index system is kind of very uh, debatable now. Okay. I think that, that's right for much academic debate as well. Yeah. Um, okay, other questions or? Jose, Fermity, grab the mic. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, just wanted to ask you, do you see any parallels between the Gold Coast and the Glasgow uh, Commonwealth Games and what Barcelona did with the Games 1992? How do you see the parallels or what, what, what have you learned from all those events? Um, yes, no, I'm, I drew upon a lot of uh, John Hargreaves' work on uh, the 1992 Barcelona Games um, for my own from one in Glasgow 2014, in the sense of there's a parallel there in terms of the tensions between uh, Catalanization and Espanolization, and I guess the the tensions between the the kind of state Castilian uh, Madrid-based government and then the the Catalonian government about who takes credit for it there. So, in, in sense of political symbolism, there's a lot of um, analogies between the two the two um, the two events in 1992 Barcelona 
and 2014 Glasgow, again, it being a second order event, not to the same extent. Um, but again, I guess if we then look at Glas uh, Gold Coast 2018, uh, what Barcelona was widely praised for was actually using the games for a form of kind of uh, economic and infrastructural regeneration. Um, and anyone who's visited Barcelona and seen some of the, the impact that had on, on the, the coastline there and all the rest of it will see themselves the benefits they did have. And I think in the Gold Coast, they've kind of seen other events which have kind of used it for those purposes and, and then being able to kind of use it to drive through what is probably a 20-year plan in terms of economic and infrastructural regeneration in a more condensed period of time and, and really harness investment there as well. Um, <laughs> The extent to which the extent to which the Gold Coast will be successful with Barcelona, I'm I, I, I'm doubtful of, and I, I think um, Barcelona, I guess, turned that kind of um, turned the ideas of what legacy and what could be done about games around a little bit. But but again, with Barcelona um, and the Gold Coast and Glasgow 2014, as I kind of tried to touch upon in our presentation, that's kind of the snuck in through the back door the economics and infrastructure and tourism and everyone says oh it's about sport we're going to try and inspire a generation in London 2012 or tackle health and inequalities in Glasgow and for me the, the rhetoric could just be a little bit more open and honest about actually we're doing it for these purposes we'll host it for a couple of weeks but this is the real goal and if you kind of say that then then fair enough and I think I think for Barcelona 1992 there was a lot more openness about that before the games organisers, the IOC, the FIFAs of this world, the, the CGF, almost said you must have a sport and legacy. That must be almost part of the bid document, which forces people, in my opinion, to have to lie, to have to say, we know that all the evidence says this won't happen, but you want us to say this, so I'm going to say it anyway, uh, which everyone knows it. Sounds like applying for any grant. Well, yeah. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that, that's the thing. So. You can't you can't blame host cities too much in the sense that they're just they're jumping through the hoops that they're asked to jump through. Um, some do it well, some do it badly. And actually, the three games I think, broadly speaking, have been successes in different ways. Um, but again, the, the scales are different. Yeah. Gentleman at the back there. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, quick question about Dennis Rodman. Uh, much has been said about his involvement and friendship with the North Korean leader. Um, any, is there anything that behind it that would make us think that um, basketball in this case could um, make North Koreans' position on sports in general uh, any internaliz internalization or opening the borders uh, or something happening around it? I mean, Lindsay's probably the expert on that. Um, <laughs> there you go. She got a mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lindsay, yeah. yeah, Lindsay. Well, I don't know if I have tons to say about the exact Dennis Rodman issue. I can say that, you know, in our discussions uh, over the course of this past week on sports and diplomacy and exchanges, you know, certainly basketball has cropped up as one of these global sports that has always been there, perhaps not as much in the limelight. Um, as recently, but very much helping to transition between um, different regimes, different political parts of the world. And one of the examples we keep bringing up is uh, China um, under the People's Republic, uh, certainly used a lot of basketball diplomacy in establishing or helping to cement its opening of relations with different countries in the West, different countries in Eastern Europe, in Asia. And so basketball has actually been at the forefront of a lot of uh, this uh, type of sports diplomacy. But I'm certainly by no means the expert on Dennis Rodman and Korea, and so I, I actually uh, <laughs> fling that back at the panel. <laughs> Is there anything from your... I mean, what was your cogitating on that, Jay? I would say something about the sort of celebrity diplomacy. And I think the there's a, um, a commodification of athletes that allows them a profile and a platform that means that they can uh, communicate in a way that um, you know I would consider to be or to give them access to a, a diplomatic plane of communication but at the same time that's not their sole goal and indeed not even primary secondary or tertiary goal at many points um, their athletic career um, is you know the prime thing if they're an active athlete their commercial well-being is you know uh, even intimately intertwined with that goal 
and you know maintaining and establishing a relationship that allows that to be perpetuated now many top level athletes now um who get paid large large amounts of money have either individual foundations or are contractually obliged to participate in foundation type activity so nba cares um being an example uh, the premier league foundation each of these have a you know and athletes have a degree of liberty but also a degree of um compulsion is perhaps too strong a word but obligation to participate in a number of foundational sort of effectively charity style uh, events and i think in that sense you do see the the athlete as a diplomat and you can uh, attribute um certain qualities that you know we'd like to see perhaps in our uh, most corinthian uh, uh, interpretation of uh, olympism as you know values that are universal and we would like to see uh, replicated in other walks of life but equally you know athletes have failings like everyone else in society and that platform and that profile that they have means that that can be magnified and um you know discussed in the other channels in ways that are not necessarily helpful and i think this brings to you know perhaps the the athlete is um just the, the sort of symbol or the, the the front end of this but the you know there's the dark side of sport and diplomacy as well which we need to be cognizant of and sport not only has its reconciliatory qualities but it has its um you know aggressive uh qualities to it and they can exacerbate um those existing tensions in the same way that they can mitigate against them and that really comes back to the function of diplomacy as opposed to the vehicle or the tool or the platform and that therefore the um relationship needs to be well understood between the relationship in this case of the platform being sport and the goal of the enterprise you know the um war uh, in the balkans in the early 1990s was absolutely stoked by um extant rivalries between different parts of what was then the yugoslavia broke up into bosnia and uh, slovenia and uh, yugoslavia etc uh, serbia etc and you know some of the worst you know human rights atrocities of the the decade amongst others um took place in those because of you know facilitated by you know football rivalries um you know Stu here from uh, Edinburgh could talk about the other city in Scotland um where you know rivalries are you know very much to the fore and have you know cost people's lives so there's much here to be said about the profile that an athlete has either way in Dennis Rodman's case it's just bizarre <laughs> is my thought it is bizarre and but it's very powerfully uh, working well as well uh, one thing i'm i'm a little bit concerned uh, is there very much is a instrumentalist view on sports uh they especially in the during this olympics is some kind of the political approach to the sports was uh, really just to utilize you to uh, the sports or sportsmen's and as a certain uh, for certain purpose uh, whether they are big national interest or for their some kind of the uh, more uh, diplomatic relations but sports also is not just about a uh, side step or uh this the tool or instrumental for another bigger purpose they are always is integrated into the certain societies so uh during the the period of the formation of the unified female hockey teams uh, there was a big uh, uh, the debates whether north korean players who are not uh, uh who uh, did meet the global standard should be integrated into the South Korean team because they've been spending a couple of years to make it, uh the cut to the final and how you can actually that the 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 way they've been dealing with the South Korean government and then IOC was that well this sport is smaller than politics there is a big cut we needed to think about and that and then sportsmen's perspective were very much sir uh, uh, marginalized at the time so whenever uh, privilege a certain political view over or uh, the purpose over another small values that would create a certain uh, uh, the issues later for instance is uh, pyongyang seoul and the north south korean intercommunication should be de- dealt with the certain uh, uh, equal values not as a certain events and sports uh, are just s- serving for bigger 
things. So I, I'm a little bit concerned about the in, uh, instrumentalist approach to this as sports. If I can just come in on that briefly. Apart, I mean, apart from Des Rodman, all, all I have on that is uh, it makes me smile every time I see that photo of him um, uh, with with uh, Kim Jong Il. But um, talking up, touching on what um, Simon said about the dark side of it for the 2014 independence referendum. Um, there was an attempt by both sides to mobilise sports people to go for a yes vote or a no vote. And, and the no's vote was more successful. We managed to get David Beckham, roll him out, and, and that would be a way of in, encouraging people to want to stay as part of the UK. We had a lot of ex-Scottish internationals and uh, Rangers players and um, British athletes who were advocating a no vote. But they have a slightly vested interest in the fact that their funding comes from the UK. They train in the UK, so there's there's elements there as well. But on the dark side, Andy Murray was one of the few who came out for a yes vote in the, the wee hours of the morning before. And some of the, the vitriol that he received, and that was actually both sides, but the vitriol he received, comments about being killed at Dunblane and uh, all sorts of expletives um, from Twitter trolls. Lindsay Sharp, who um, came out for a, a, a no vote, got likewise from um, the yes uh, people on Twitter there as well and I think that's quite sad I actually think sports people and athletes should be able to have a political view yes they do have a platform and they're all human beings but as, as Simon's touching upon there's so many different commercial uh, and not just commercial but kind of um, rules put in by national government bodies about you cannot and will not say this um, which I think is sad because actually they maybe are a, a voice for, for different positions um, but again um, it's slightly different than what Andy Murray and Lindsay Sharp might say in the reaction they would get compared to a, a Dennis Rodman. Um, um, yeah. Okay, um, we've got a question from Linda and then one from Sean. Hi, I think you've probably picked up on quite a bit as, a, as I've been waiting to ask the question, <laughs> so, which is great. But it was, for me, I was just wondering about the sort of the hidden sponsors here, like Nike and the big big commercial organisations that are international, multinational, and and how they mix up into this mix of political diplomacy and sports diplomacy and so on, and kind of what the impact is there and what the, the hidden um, things behind that are, the commercialisation, I guess, of the outcomes from the events as well. Thank you. I'm going to take Sean's question as well, mindful of time, and he may well have something to say on that. No, that's right. I, I mean, I just want to put this proposition to you. I mean, is there, is, there an, is there an honesty to a bid like Glasgow, London, Gold Coast, that is fundamentally an economic bid? It's basically saying, yeah, we're going to have this big festival. It's really about economic generation, regeneration. So you do your numbers and you decide what you're going to do. But there's a problem with things like Qatar, Sochi, Russia World Cup and the way that North Korea has manipulated uh, Pyongyang is that essentially what what the sports what the Olympic movement is doing is to allow regimes which are basically fundamentally anti-democratic to launder their reputations and in fact the sports movement and the billion cities are actually complicit in this they're actually complicit in in, in something which actually you know, we, 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 it's 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 not it's not it's not healthy for for global politics. I mean, the Sochi bit game is not just about the do the alleged doping, or but obviously, I mean, there's a lot of reports that say it was the biggest money laundering exercise that has ever been implemented in the history of the of the, of the world. So I mean, you know, I was very struck by your comments about the way you know the, the particular cartoon, um, you know. Actually, is is, is uh, you know, is this is this actually quite dangerous? Is, is is sport diplomacy practiced most effectively by regimes that you can't vote in? That's a good question, Sean. I'm going to come in on Linda's first. Then, I'm, while uh, I'm thinking about the answer to that, but other people might like to chip in too. Um, you know, it is a multi-million, indeed billion-dollar business. And you look at the uh, and the real. Uh, dynamic here, I think, over the last 15, 20, 25 years, again, which Sean would be able to talk to as well, is the involvement of media corporations. And in the Nikes and, uh, you know, the sort of uh, Adidas and sponsorship that you see on the banners is nothing compared to the medium by which you broadcast that. And the transition um, from, you know, terrestrial free-to-air broadcast to digital 
satellite broadcast and indeed into the future where you know it's all available here that really is the is the the sales uh, dimension now what else you're selling at that point is um you know that that's the real uh, sneaky part of it if you like you know the uh, sports gambling industry you know the rules and regulations on that are pretty um, loose should we say not least because they are industries that have been regulated to a degree to which they have within national governance structures and that we are now in transnational uh, environment so it's not easy to implement or indeed get the buy-in and then have the consequences to any governance structure you know some sort of sanction in an international environment where you have different jurisdictions because you do come back to jurisdiction sovereignty all those good bastions of international relations um, you know scholarship so i think the idea of these multinational corporations and how they fit in they're not it, it, this is something that i don't see as being particularly unique to sport but nonetheless sport manifests itself in a particular way because of the communicative power so that's not just the ability to sell a shirt or a pair of um, you know football boots or what have you but the ability to um, be available and communicate across national boundaries age gender race to you know communities of like-minded individuals some of whom have access to finance and some of whom don't and that you know disparity is a real challenge if you're selling a coherent product and I don't think that reflects to sport that's you know part of the dilemma of selling you know now say education uh, as well so that's one of the the challenges i would see in that and it manifests itself in all sorts of ways you know the vested interest the contractual obligations you know image rights for athletes you know that's what's the last part of any transfer dealing is you know um, is you know the Im individual image rights who owns my right to sell my image to um you know uh, to be on the front cover of the fifa or the nba 2k you know computer game you know the e-game environment you know that's not the athletic enterprise it's the representation of the athletic enterprise so it's fascinating stuff and, and you know it's moving very very quickly so, you, I'll, I'll maybe try and segue between both questions um firstly with the the one about commercial sponsors and and the impact that i had uh, one of the main benefits of my phd doing the interviews was seeing some of the finding out about some of the back channeling and the kind of things that are happening behind the scenes. So the SNP were threatened that if they'd made it political, that they would be kind of called out by other major parties. And everyone that I spoke to from the SNP, Labour, Lib Dems, Greens, Conservatives, all said the same there. Um, but what was really interesting, and, and fortunately my, my interview said I could kind of disclose their names, but it was Tavish Scott from the Lib Dems said to me that he had some very interesting discussions with some of the sponsors about if the SNP did try and politicise the games, what would happen? And they were going to pull out from the games, they were going to withdraw their funding, and they said explicitly, if this game becomes politicised about the referendum, we are pulling the plug. So whilst the other parties might say, well, we put the SNP under pressure not to make this political, it wasn't really. It was the commercial sponsors, it was the tens of millions of pounds going towards the the, the budget, which would have been the, the real kind of factor there. So when we think about diplomacy and governance about that there as well, I guess it is those multi-layers of influence in, that, that shape things along there. And I think sponsors do have a, a big element there as well. Uh, turning to, to Sean's very uh, detailed in, and, and uh, provocative and kind of difficult question to answer. Um, yes, I agree that actually the economic side of things is probably how the, if we say the Western countries and, and the more established countries now view this and, if they were open and honest about it, that would be great. And I think a lot of other nations, Sochi, Russia, um, elsewhere, Qatar, are using it to launder their reputations, as you kind of said there. But I don't think we are innocent in that sense there as well. I think um, tw London 2012, in many ways, was to rebrand the UK as, as something different. And I think Glasgow, to an extent as well, um, within the Commonwealth, was to kind of almost um, rebuild bridges and almost acknowledge Scotland's role within the empire and Scots like to almost think, oh, that was the Brits. We Scots were all right, but we were just as bad, if not if not worse, some of the things we did within the empire. So I think we do it in different ways. Um, but as you say, I think th the final thought I'd have on it would be, in terms of diplomacy, what's really interesting about Russia and Qatar and all the rest of it is that they are, even though they're not made democratic themselves, they are using democratic means via votes in FIFA, 
votes in IOC to influence other nations to vote for them. And actually, their di diplomacy has actually been quite effective because they are getting enough votes to get people to go that way. Qatar can offer to ship stadiums to other African nations and build them that way. So they're almost using diplomatic means within... Oh, well, yeah, of course. There's all, all the rest of the bribes as well, but... Oh, without without a shadow of doubt, and I'm not I'm not absolving them of blame whatsoever. Um, but if that's the game of diplomacy, and if even if that's diplomacy, what is front stage and the backstage stuff of the corrupt elements of it there as well, we need to understand. I'd say if the chat I learned today: diplomacy and governance is not just about states; uh, it's commercial actors, and it's what's overt and clear, and what's hidden behind there. And we might want to think diplomacy is something which is ambassadors and shaking hands and all kind of very formal. But I think we now know in sport it's corruption, it's bribery, it's all the other things that influence and, and make people work towards there. Um, and as someone who maybe is very dismissive or very upset by some of the ideologies and the human rights campaigns and sorry, records of some of the host nations, it worries me in some ways that diplomatic means are being used to abuse what could be major sporting events. Steve, you may wait for just for a mic, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Thanks. I've just been reflecting on one of your slides, uh, Stu, where you implied the ending of the Commonwealth Games because of its becoming increasingly white dominated. Um, and you relate that to what are the drivers behind the games. You've got the Commonwealth, which is, what, a third of the world's um, population are within the Commonwealth. But it's white dominated because the major states of India, Nigeria, Pakistan underperform relatively to their population sizes. So when you look at the dynamics, when you look at the influence of government and non state actors driving the games, what are the drivers behind your belief that the Commonwealth Games does not have a future? I, I think possibly, uh, maybe misrepresenting if I think the Commonwealth Games don't have a future. I, 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 they will, well, it was, it was quite perilous for a while. I mean, when Durban pulled out, there was a little bit of concern about there and there's been concerns in the past. Glasgow 2014 was deemed to be one that put it back on, on the right route. I, I don't think the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Games don't have a future. Um, but I I do wonder about their their continued relevance and if the media and the sponsors don't necessarily get on board with it there as well. Um, I, I think my concerns are, what what's the relevance of the Games to the broader Commonwealth if it's not just embracing those other nations. So is it actually just going to be a Commonwealth Games, but really it's for those 10, 12 nations who've dominated historically? Um, and my, my, I guess my concern about the Games more broadly is, will it actually be a useful diplomatic means to, to almost foster warmer relationships with the kind of more peripheral nations within the Commonwealth Games. On the point of India, India is a very interesting one. Actually, India had probably the best games for a long time in terms of medals and, and something which they are uh, quite keen to kind of push in terms of their own um, sporting profile and whatnot. But um, again, if the hosting is 2026 20, in Kuala Lumpur, that'd be a good step forward. But can we take it? I mean, Scotland competed with Abuja and Nigeria and won. Um, Durban were supposed to have the games and then they've had it stripped away. Um, can we make it something which is actually reflective of the wider Commonwealth movement rather than just the traditional bashings? And I think that will really keep the games going forward and, and build the momentum, not just as a sporting event, but something which is worthwhile in terms of diplomacy as well. Otherwise, I think it's a bit tokenism. I don't think the games will finish at any point soon, but it could be a few iterations down the line. They might run into more um, sticky sticky patches. I mean, I think it's, it, it's a good question to ask this week because, of course, in London, the Chogham meeting yeah. is happening now and last week the Commonwealth Games finished. So you have all of the Commonwealth heads of government here, um, you know, in the imperial capital. Um, and I think one of the um, sort of questions where, you know, what impact is, you know, what happened in the previous two weeks, you know, 6,000 miles away on the Gold Coast having? Well, a lot of those 
leaders, Will, not ours, she's been busy, um, been to the Commonwealth Games and have come back. And the fact that we have, you know, that the, you know, maybe it's not a particular um, comment on the, the government in face, but the imperial legacy that the United Kingdom has has been, you know, front and foremost of the, you know, the UK news for the past 48, 72 hours because of, you know, where our, uh, you know, the, the quarter, fifth of the world's population, half the world being painted pink on the map, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, you know, very salient reasons why sport has a role to play, to my mind. I take Jay's point entirely about the instrumentalism and the number of times that, you know, and, I, and I've I'm certainly uh, guilty of it, but a uh, content analysis of role, vehicle, use, um, uh, medium um, for sport to, um, in the conversations we have is something that troubles me. And I don't think that we've got, we, we need to be very um, thoughtful about our use of um, the relationship, which is why, to my mind, it's very much the multi-directional nature of it that matters. It's not someone doing something to someone else as it were, the metaphor, it's actually about the relationship and the influencing factors across all of those those vectors. That was me talking again. Um, I'm going to uh, draw uh, events to a close now because we've had, um, we need to get these people another drink for starters. <laughs> um, but I would like to thank you all very much for coming. It's been a fascinating day, whether you've been here this evening or indeed colleagues who were here earlier. Um, if uh, those of us who are um, heading off, if we can meet just outside on the steps, that would be great. But thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.